Um, I think we'd like to kind of talk a little bit about the, you know, what's out there. What is embedded system cybersecurity? What are the key things we're thinking about? You know, when we talk about embedded systems, thinking about the hardware or the software, and um, that's part of a larger system often, um, as well as you know, our own solutions at BlackBerry. I, you know, I don't think people fully understand that the breadth and the, the range of the, the solutions we have were often associated with things like QNX um, and the operating system, but there's much more to what we do, including things like BlackBerry Jarvis, which we'll, we'll touch on today. So I guess the first question, and maybe Adam, I'll start with yourself, is, is just you know, when we talk about embedded systems, embedded security, why is it so important? And what are the different challenges that we see in an embedded space to a general purpose system? So um, th there is something really um, important and significant to understand between embedded systems and sort of general purpose. Um, and one is firstly the context of these systems. So with embedded, you typically expect it to perform um, you know, a, one particular type of function. So we could think of something like a, a pacemaker, for example. And we do tend to think of embedded systems within a safety critical aspect as well. That's a sort of general consensus with embedded. Not all embedded systems are uh, safety critical systems because not everything has a, an actuator, which really sort of makes up the fundamental of a safety critical system. Um, but we generally sort of, they, they generally do sort of go hand in hand because of the nature of embedded, it, it's built for a particular function. And then with general purpose, of course, everyone's familiar with that in terms of desktop computers and this flexibility on solutions and uses you can put to that. And, you know, arguably we sort of use these every day. I, I would even sort of really consider a, a, a smartphone to be more of a general purpose computer than embedded where maybe historically you may have looked at a, a mobile phone in terms of a more embedded system, right? When it had just a specific function to make phone calls, send text messages, very limited set of functionality there and not sort of, you know, being able to use apps and, uh, you know, all, all this idea of OTA behind it. So the reason why they are very significant in terms of the difference is because of the assurances you need on them. So if we take that general approach and say, that a uh, an embedded system is generally to do with a safety critical aspect. Well, of course, the the risk and the impact is very different from general purpose um, machines or general purpose solutions. So, therefore, they do need to be looked at in a uh, in a, in a different light. The the risks, the standards, the regulatory compliance will be very different than general purpose software because of the nature of what you're using these because of the potential impact uh, and then secondly from um, an assurance perspective and really where we come from in terms of our solution with blackberry jarvis and binary static analysis the the key difference that we've really learned on looking at the implementation of these solutions is that you do tend to find that uh, embedded systems are often um, more closed from a software supply chain there is a, um, a bit of a dependency, a bit of a difference on the use of open source software. And, um, and thirdly, you do tend to see uh, more use of proprietary file formats, whether it's applications or data storage. Um, and also um, with the use of the, the hardware as well. Bearing in mind that when you make an embedded system and it has a specific use, that um, you know, you're not going to offer huge amounts of computing resources because you're building it and confining it and managing costs and everything else uh, to be built within specific hardware requirements. So that um, does cause a difference on the analysis, which is going to be done, um, and therefore the mitigations as well, because you are limited in terms of compute resources. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, any, any any thoughts from yourself, Chris, on these kind of challenges between the embedded and general purpose systems? Yeah, I think that uh, like embedded systems from a technology point of view are more likely to be, um, you know, to have time critical uh, aspects to them or be uh, running on an RTOS. Um, I think that uh, embedded systems are less likely to be um, generated with a, a kind of uh, um, uh, third generation language, fourth generation 
computer language. And so, uh, you know, due to that time criticality, you're, you're going to be a lot closer to what the hardware is doing. You're going to be uh, authoring in C, C++ or assembly. Um, and, you know, those, those languages are inherently, uh, you know, inherently have more um, uh, or, or weaker security um, potential. So not necessarily that they're going to be weak in, in the security posture, but you have to be more careful because you're operating uh, at a lower level. Yeah, as a yeah. developer. I, I think um, you know we, we've seen uh, kind of from this isolating an embedded system. One of the problems is how it's governed as well in the security governance of this. And you think about things like patch management and, and how it fits into risk appetite and risk thresholds. I think we've all seen where some of the embedded systems have been a, a secondary thought. The engineers and developers have built these systems, but how do we get security to be part of that, um, that expectation? It, it isn't always where we'd expect. I think we've, we've all kind of seen that in various forms or another, haven't we? Uh, and Chris, Chris's point is actually really, you know, really important and not to be glossed over. You know, he mentioned about, you talk about scheduling, Chris, and this deterministic and non-deterministic difference of systems. This is where we've been learning and obviously over, over decades with BlackBerry having safety and security critical solutions, especially with QNX Artos, is that these, this is, these are, this is a really important point with um, the, the real-time operating system and deterministic and being deterministic and scheduling is that this is where security requirements can come in and there's that delicate balance um, so as we sort of mentioned earlier about the hardware requirements and then the nature of the operating system and timing, that that's so critical. And you, you find that often there can be this trap that it can easily be fooled into, and I'm, I'm sure we'll explore it further on particular requirements, that it's easy to come across and say to a safety team, apply all these security measurements, right? Add all these mitigations in, here's the best practices, here's 600 non-functional requirements that you should adhere to. You know that that's great, but I mean, you if if you do follow all of them or attempted to, you'd pretty much guarantee that the the safety of the system um, is is pretty much torn apart to the point that it's not it's probably not even operational anymore, right? So that that overhead um, actually will just destroy a safety critical system. So it, it's there's, there's this very fine balance, um, almost like an art, if you like, between the two disciplines. That needs to be worked out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree. And you know, I think this is a, obviously an introductory um, podcast episode, but I think well, it's one of the things that we'll really deep dive into and, and understand these challenges and, and everything else in um, in a little bit more depth. So, one of the things I think we want to talk a little bit about today as well was what are the big drivers behind cybersecurity from an embedded perspective. And I think one of the things that's on everyone's kind of lips right now is the executive order by President Biden and how that's influencing our thoughts around uh, the software bill of material and, and some of the wider challenges that that presents. And I guess for listeners who, who aren't aware, an executive order is issued by the president in, in the United States, in this case, President Biden. Um, it does impact other countries um, in some form or another, requests to allies as they have with the, the current um, executive order. And it can cover everything. Um, if you look at the history of um, executive orders in the US, you know things like bank holidays, improvement to labor laws are all covered under there. But what we're particularly interested about in, in, in the recent President Biden executive order is this drive to improve the nation's cybersecurity and really thinking about critical national infrastructure, that embedded world that for a long time has potentially been neglected, at least hasn't seen the attention it probably should have seen. Um, you know, it encompasses a lot of the cybersecurity world, but has a real focus on, on the software bill of materials. And again, that's another big area that we're seeing more and more attention paid to. So, Chris, I know you've had a, a huge amount of kind of interest in the SBOM. We'll, we'll touch upon that in a second. But um, what, one of the questions, Adam, for yourself is, you know, what, what does the executive order outline? Is there anything in there that we should be aware of, anything that we should particularly be taking note of um, or, or have concerns about? So... The, the the executive order for for the S one uh, it's fourteen zero two eight isn't it? Um, the, so the the uh, minimum elements for the S bomb. I think what's first first very important to understand is the, the context of the S bomb and where it applies. So the executive order is not law. Um, it defines how the federal agencies must operate. Um, so it, it can't tell industry providers, for example, what they must do. 
and this is at the moment all in relation to supplying the uh, the US government with uh, software solutions um, that are deemed critical. Now, there's lots of definitions in there, but generally for industry providers, um, this is, is, is not necessarily a major concern yet, but it is very useful to understand that this stuff is going to come right. It's not going to go away. So sort of burying your head in the sand or saying, oh, it doesn't apply to us. We know the way industries develop right and standards. This is coming. So this is a first sort of uh, a first step up, if you like, because everyone knows that these things aren't perfect when they start. It requires time to mature it. So at the moment, recognize where it is actually impacted and the intention behind it all. Um, it is a cybersecurity initiative. We're talking about minimizing future threats. This is about modernizing security defenses. And the SBOM quite simply is this ability to provide uh, the, the list of ingredients essentially for your software. So at a high level, sounds really straightforward, but I know in subsequent podcasts, we will have to go into detail as it is extremely complex and there's many different perspectives to meet all this and decide what assurances mean. Um, uh, you know, there's even details about things like when we talk about critical software um, and if, at, at the moment, um, the executive order used the NIST definition, which is obviously the best one to go with. And that's, that, that just talks about software that essentially has, uh, you know, high access privileges. So very broad sense. So it, it does sort of cover all sorts of solutions. We're not talking about safety critical systems. We're just talking about critical systems. So that's what the executive order is coming. But at the moment, it's for how federal agencies must operate. Thank you.